Hey, what's good, self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great, and I wanna welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan, and I'm the mind behind Make More Capital, and today we're gonna to do a quick midweek update of what we've seen happen this week in cannabis. So before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, all I ask is that you leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And then of course, if you wanna learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss any future videos, and there's plenty of content that you can go back and rewatch. So I just wanted to show this for perspective for any new investors uh, or investors getting impatient because they're expecting results sooner than later. So first thing to point out is I'm not a trader and I'm not providing information for short-term traders. I'm providing cannabis industry facts to self-direct investors so that they can position themselves properly to capitalize over the long run. So if you don't have patience, you will in time as this industry is the perfect teacher. So just trust that the day-to-day -day share price doesn't matter. Facts on the ground and the laws of supply and demand do. And we know that cannabis uh, you know, made $17.5 billion in sales up from 12.1 in 2019. We know that cannabis is one of the fastest growing job drivers with 321,000 employed in the U.S. full time. We know all of this on the ground and that's what I've been covering. So just to point out that if you've recently gotten in and, and you think, or you're getting impatient, just, I want to remind you that you're, you've joined into a game that's been played for a very long time. And for, for success, you want to learn how the game is played and you don't want to necessarily try to tilt the game to work in your favor because it's just not that's just not how investing works right so zooming out six months from now you know had you learned about this industry and gotten in in, in october when i was actually making these videos and, and encouraging people trying to educate you would have benefited a lot more just had you gotten in at a previous time when when the bull run was just about to commence now if we zoom out in fact if you got in a year ago when you know everyone was losing their mind because the world was flipped upside down every cause and every reason for people to be doing that well, though, if you had cash and you had the no to invest in the cannabis industry, you would have benefited so much um, and, and you'd be sitting up high right now. So it just really depends when you get in on the industry. And so just to point out that, you know, when we hit all time highs on February 10th, 2021, that was probably the closest that these US MSOs were at their fair value, like their book value with no future growth priced in at all, which means even on February 10th, these MSOs were still undervalued, which means if you're getting impatient or getting scared now and you want to sell, that's just going to be a loss. Like you're just, it's just the wrong decision to make at this point in time. So just a reminder that as of right now, if you have cash, you should be trying to buy more shares if you can. And if you don't have cash, that's likely because you've bought. And now, you know, if you had cash, you would average down. You don't. So you're like, okay, well, you know, I just want to make sure that I do get that cash back eventually. And so just to zoom out again, over the last five years, a lot of this was from Canada and the hype of Canada. But as you can see, we hit new all-time highs, 2018, 2019. Um, and if, if you think nothing has changed from the cannabis companies down here to up here, it's just, it's wrong. So just trying to give you as much perspective and really ground you, uh, ground you as much as I am, because it's really my underlying knowledge of the industry that, that allows me to, you know, to see this and to, to think it's time to buy more. Oh, I'm so fortunate that, that these prices have fallen to a discount or, you know, they're on sale for a bit longer and I can buy more. And so just want to remind you that tomorrow we have Cresco Labs releasing their earnings. I'm fairly confident that Cresco is going to uh, put out larger revenue numbers than Green Thumb Industries, uh, just based on the growth that they were seeing in Q3. So we're gonna have to wait and see until tomorrow, but that's what I'm expecting. And then we do have New York still to announce uh, their their plan for legalization before April 1st. And they're working hard for that. We'll cover that in a moment. So all of these factors are really happening on the ground. So again, folks, do not let the day-to-day -day share price dictate how you feel or what decisions you make. Make sure it's based on the fundamentals, uh, because I think this is really just the calm before the storm. Uh, now, going forward, cannabis banking bill was reintroduced in the Senate with nearly a third of the chamber signed on so far. So that is great news. This is referring to the Safe Banking Act, um, and it was introduced uh, in the Senate, reintroduced in the Senate, sorry, with nearly a third of the chamber as co-sponsor so far. It's a development that takes new light now that Democrats are back in control of the chamber. Um, but so, so the main thing is that the Senate version is being sponsored by Jeff, uh, Jeff Merkley, who's a Democrat from Oregon, and then Steve Daines, who's a Republican. So this is bipartisan, having a Republican and a Democrat bringing this up. Now, like, bipartisan, does it really even matter? No. But in politics, Having one member from both sides seems like you're making progress, seems like a big deal. And so far, 27 co-sponsors besides these two uh, seems to be a bigger number than we thought we could get in the Senate as you need more than 60 to, to, to pass, right? So, or at least to pass smoothly without, without instances of um, 
without any interruptions. But in the House, the legislation has more than 100 members who've signed on as co-sponsors so far. So hopefully that safe can move very quickly through the House and then through the Senate. Um, and the main thing is, where did it mention? With the Democrats now in control of both chambers of Congress and the White House, industry stakeholders are optimistic that the legislation stands a solid chance of becoming law this year. So that is a very positive development. Again, a lot of coulds and consider, but um, the Senate represents the bill's most significant obstacle last session under the GOP control. But now that the GOP is not in control, um, and you know banks have been lobbying for this, and it only just makes sense at this point because things are it just the existing laws seem just so out of whack as 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 is so far. Very positive development there, um, and you know hopefully this can just get through sooner than later. And although they say by the end of the year, that would be better than not at all, right? I mean, just learn to be patient. Make sure you, you balance your spending cash well enough so that you don't need to dip into your investments and be patient. That's that's how I managed to capitalize on a free up. And so as someone who's been in this industry since 2018, patience goes a long way. Now, uh, this is a great interview with, with CEO Charles Bachtel from Cresco Labs, so I'm just going to play it for you. Just last week, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo said the state is close to moving on recreational use. Meantime, the Senate is set to take up the Safe Banking Act later this week, a bill would, um, which would allow cannabis companies access to the federal banking system and help eliminate the dangers of doing their business in cash. And so this, this tweet came out March 22nd, so two days ago uh, at about 6 p.m. You might wonder, well, why aren't I seeing this on Fox News, on CNN? Well, they don't want you to know that all of this development around cannabis is happening because they're right-wing publications. It doesn't mean that it's not happening. I'm trying to be as objective of a news source as possible. CNBC is one of the only mainstream networks highlighting this. But as she just said, New York uh, and Governor Cuomo are working hard to get that done. And the Senate or, you know, uh, Congress plans to introduce, reintroduce the safe bill. And each thing that she said, uh, you know, I mean, I'm going to touch on New York as we go through. And I'm also, well... I did just cover the fact that the Safe Banking Act did get reintroduced. So things are happening at the pace that people are saying they are. It's just a matter of finding, you know, credible news sources, giving accurate information and making sure you're basing your, your judgment off of that. Let's talk more about all this with Charlie Bocktel, the CEO of Cresco Labs. Charlie, great to see you again. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Which is the bigger impact for your business? I mean, you, you have uh, dispensaries all already in, in New York, so you would benefit from from opening up that market. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if I was going to, if I had to rate which would be larger uh, for either Cresco Labs or for the industry, New York or, or sort of a federal change, I think you'd have to go with a federal change. You, you, you... And I mean, yes, I want federal change first, but I just know, like, sadly, it's not under my control. And we know that legislation for investors and for business always passes before legislation for the citizens and the people. That's just a fact. And that's why I felt compelled to learn how to invest. And, you know, it, it it's a very good skill to learn. You, you can't sort of downplay the importance of a state like New York uh, passing adult use legislation. But, you know, we'd love to see the SAFE Act uh, make its way through Congress and, and be a, a cannabis related piece of legislation that actually gets uh, gets implemented. So we're, we're you know, optimistic for both. Uh, that's that's the good spot that we're in. What, what's the first thing you do if that SAFE Act passes? You know, safe is a, it, it's such a dynamic component, right? Because because access to capital has been so difficult in this industry. And again, this is an industry that is the fastest growing industry in America. Uh, increased the, the, uh, to 320,000 plus uh, full-time employees uh, in the industry last year. That's up 32%. So this is an incredibly fast moving dynamic industry that we still have, you know, a hand tied behind our back without access to traditional banking. Um, so the, the unlock for a company like us would be, of course, bringing cost of capital down, uh, making it more traditional in the sense of potentially using lines of credit to smooth out cash flow, financing real estate CapEx projects with traditional or more traditional rates than are currently available. But the real unlock here, too, is the, the social equity, social responsibility uh, dynamic of access to capital. As this industry is developing and all of these state laws are being passed that incorporate these inclusive, diverse components to them, access to capital is still the biggest gating issue for anybody to get into the space. Yep. Hey, Charlie, it's Tim. Let's talk about some stuff Crespo, Cresco specific. And, and first of all, you, know, you guys are at, in seven of the 10 biggest popular states in the country. You're in seven billion dollar markets. And, and you guys have had a slightly different approach to uh, wholesale distribution and essentially the, the, the wholesale door sale. And now, I just want to comment on this, because if we look at the big four MSOs, Cureleaf has gone with as many dispensaries in as many states, largest footprint as possible. They have over 101 dispensaries open now. That is their aim. 
GTI was to go into Illinois and, and dominate that state first uh, and, and, and build out from there, but they also went with as many dispensaries and an increased footprint as possible. So they, they followed a similar model, and clearly they've shown that that is a great model uh, and is profitable, and they're growing healthily with it. Now, if we look at TrueLeave, though, TrueLeave went one state dominant, and they focused on Florida mostly, and right now that's why they have more than 50% market share of Florida's medical market, which is why TrueLeave is also very strong, and now they are planning to expand outside of states. But where Cresco Labs was a little bit different than those four is that they only aimed for about 20 20. Uh, I think they have 29 licenses in total, but as of right now, only 21 or so dispensaries. But their plan was to get dispensaries in the main states, so that includes Illinois, New York, um, Arizona, just based on when that legalization would happen. But so, so they have a much less amount of dispensaries uh, and, and footprint necessarily, or store outlets, but they focused heavily on wholesale and the consumer packaged goods model where, you know, in states where they are legally able to sell, they also have cultivation so that they can build up their, their so they, they can create their products, p- package it pre-made for customers. And what they can do is if any dispensary is saying, hey, we're out of cannabis, we need it. They do the wholesale route and they just supply their consumer packaged goods as is. And so because they probably don't have as much cost on overhead because they don't have 50 or 70 or 100 dispensaries, I'm really curious to see how this this shift and focus on the wholesale, you know, growing as much cannabis as possible, making your products as, as, as attractive and as, as convenient or as good as possible and then just sending them to, to dispensaries i think that's going to uh well we're gonna have to wait until till tomorrow to see what that does to their revenues but that's why i ended up choosing well i also chose cresco based on the market price or the market capitalization at the time when i bought but it was mainly because of this strategy so we'll hear more and in, in how you're positioning the company in a world where i think the larger cnbc and fast money audience knows you know understands the cpg story Cannabis is, you know, arguably the most exciting CPG story for you know many years. Let's put it that way. Um, talk about how you're set up to to take advantage of that. Yeah, could, couldn't agree with you more. And it was really it was one of the few things you know that was really apparent to us when we first looked at this back in 2013. Was cannabis as a CPG product, whether it knew it at the time or not. Um, this was going to be branded and packaged and sort of delivered and in a traditional way that CPG is. So for us, we've always prioritized those middle two verticals of the value chain. Wanted to be vertical, it's really important to own your entire uh, aspect of the supply chain uh, today, but prioritizing that branded product sale is, is critical. And you're seeing it as the industry develops. Uh, these state programs, um, they maintain a tight control on the amount of, of supply and the number of suppliers that are in the space. And points of retail are just going to continue to get more and more and more. It's a great small business opportunity. That's where tax revenue is actually collected is at the register. So we've always had our, our sights on making sure that we created branded products that resonate with consumers and that we get them into as many doors as we can. And we've established ourselves as the largest uh, wholesaler of branded product in the industry. Charlie, great to- It's amazing. And so think of, you know, CPG is uh, chewing gum, uh, shampoo, anything that can, you just go to the store and eventually buy it like that. So obviously they're supplying adult use dispensaries, but you know, th- that's a different approach. And I'm really excited to see what tomorrow is going to bring. And so I'll obviously report on that as well. Um, but moving forward, MSOs, are they continuing to crush it? True Leaves National Expansion Momentum continues with acquisition of Mountaineer Holding LLC in West Virginia and Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commission giving green light to start growing. So I did cover these briefly in yesterday's video about True Leaves earnings, which will be below if you want to grab those and check those out. Um, but basically just goes to show that, you know, outside of Florida, True Leaf continues to expand. The Mountaineer acquisition positions True Leaf for vertical operations in West Virginia. Now, West Virginia doesn't have a legal market, a legal medical market open and set up yet, but obviously in time they will, and then hopefully True Leaf will be ready for when that's that's set to launch. The acquisition brings a cultivation permit and two additional dispensary permits to True Leaf, resulting in six dispensaries throughout the state, and it further extends and strengthens their national expansion with the ability, ability sorry, for full-scale operation in a new medical marijuana state. And in Massachusetts, their Hoy Lake facility allows for over 60,000 square feet of canopy as defined under Massachusetts regulations uh, so that they can grow, process, and um, their first harvest is expected in the second half of 2021. And what did it cost them to to acquire all of this? They agreed to acquire for an upfront payment of $6 million, comprised of $3 million in cash and $3 million in True Leave subordinate voting shares. Um, so... Seems like truly you've got a great deal. It didn't cost them much to get this, um, you know. And, and again, it's a long-term investment for 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 West Virginia, mind you. That that's you know you got to get in early. So stock of the week from Morningstar is Cureleaf. So Morningstar is very happy to uh, increase their Canadian price, which also would increase the the price for the the shares on the OTC ticker as well. But I'll just show you this. 
we still forecast the U.S. as having the greatest growth out there, with sector direct oh, full potential. We still forecast the U.S. as having the greatest growth out there, with sector director Christopher Inton projecting 25% and 15% average annual growth for recreational and medical markets, respectively. Okay, yeah, sorry, so a fair value of 32 U.S. dollars, that must be something close to 38, 39 Canadian dollars, so uh, that's a significant uh, increase from where they're trading at now. So. Again, just goes to show that now all of these investment firms are saying, oh, they're, they're too cheap. Now we got to raise their prices up here. Um, and just a <laughs> reminder not to get too impatient uh, and let your worries dictate your decisions. Now, Columbia Care, according to Canaccord, reiterates $15 price target following their Q4 results. So uh, in Canaccord's company update for Columbia Care, their analyst Matt Bottomley reiterates their $15 Canadian dollar 12-month price target. Um, so that does obviously extend for the next 12 months based on what they're going to be doing in 2021. Um, but last time I checked, I, I haven't checked recently, but Columbia Care was trading at about $8 or $7. So that, that represents a 100% price increase right there. Um, and then just on to New York. So this is from Roth uh, Investment Firms uh, from Todd Harrison. He obviously gets direct access to these and posts them. So I just try to share whatever we can get that might be relevant. But from Roth, cannabis industry update, safe banking coming with New York close to legalization. U.S. Congress appears ready to move forward on pushing the Safe Banking Act through to become the first major federal cannabis legislation on the books. We recently held our 33rd annual Roth conference where we highlighted during the cannabis state of the industry panel that the Safe Banking Act has a favorable chance to be reenacted and improved by Congress by summer break. That's a new deadline. We've heard end of summer by summer break. <coughs> the panel also focuses on New York passing adult use legislation. Finally, after three years, and we believe sides will agree ahead of the governor's budget plan on April 1st. And this is be this has to get done before April 1st, so good odds that it will. Um, and, and again, we'll, we'll see that soon. They're reiterating that they're getting closer and closer. In our U.S. operator coverage, Columbia Care, Cresco Labs, Cureleaf, and Green Thumb Industries should benefit the most from New York legalization, while the safe banking should benefit all cannabis operators, but primarily the smaller cap names of Flower One and Cushco, well positioned, especially after needed financing. So, um, I mean, of course, smaller cap, you have more upside for growth if you get lucky, but highlighting just the main companies, um, that are that are still just trading at their fair value or even undervalued. They are just a sure shot for success over the long run. Now, New York lawmakers overcome cannabis legalization impasse, say, and expect bill in the next day or so. So we still don't have an update, but I just wanted to show you the tweets that we we have. So on Sunday, I should come at you with an update. I'll likely do standalone video for Cure uh, for Cresco Labs' earnings tomorrow. Um, so if there's any update on New York, I'll announce that then. But otherwise, it'll be on Sunday. We have a few tweets from from. Um, people that are close to the Senate Majority Leader um, in New York, I guess, and said on Tuesday that the legislator is really, really close on marijuana following negotiations with executive staff off um, office over recent weeks. We've gotten past the impasse of impaired driving. So yeah, uh, Andrea S. Cousins during a virtual press conference says on talking talks pertaining to recreational cannabis, I think we are really, really close on marijuana. We've gotten past the impasse of the impaired driving. Uh, says final language to be determined. So I think we're really, really close. Again, a lot of this is just repeating the same thing. We think we think we're close. Um, and and the, the good news is is that we are getting closer. However, um, yeah, ultimately, be nice when we have a final update. Now, this is an unprecedented situation that I wanted to present. New Mexico legislative session delivers virus aid, but legal pot dies. And this was published on March 20th. So basically, just to highlight that a lot got done, um, but the the, session, the legislative session, and remember, I mentioned that in the last video, how these sessions work. Once one ends, they've got to start again, and most things that didn't end up getting passed have to be reintroduced. Lawmakers failed to pass House Bill 12, which would legalize recreational cannabis, and so this was unfortunate to see. But surprise, New Mexico governor plans special session on cannabis as legalization bill stalls on final stretch, which is very interesting. Have you ever seen a, a, like a government, a governor, a politician, uh, announce a special session to get cannabis done. No. So it just goes to show that, you know, not sure what's driving her to want to get this done other than, you know, writing past wrongs so that people aren't getting arrested for having a plant in their pocket. This is just, it's a first. So this is awesome to see. New Mexico Senate failed to hear the cannabis legalization bill uh, in this current legislative session, but with just hours before lawmakers adjourned, uh, Governor Michelle Lejeune, uh, Lujan Grisham said that she'll call them back for a special session to consider the issue of ending cannabis prohibition. We're going to have a special session in a week or so, and we're going to get cannabis because I'm not going to wait for another year, the governor said in comments. Uh, we're going to win it, and it's going to have the social justice aspect that we know have to be in the package. So that's just great that, again, a politician is kind of using her power to, to bring positive change.
very rare, but great to see. Now, a few more studies that we found. Acute cannabis intoxication in the emergency department, the effect of legalization. So in Canada, the background to this on October 17, 2018, the Cannabis Act decriminalized the recreational use of cannabis in Canada. This study seeks to determine how legalization of cannabis has impacted emergency department visits for acute cannabis intoxication. What is acute cannabis intoxication? I don't even know what that is. It sounds like a silly made up word, but what were the conclusions? Legalization was not associated with the change in the rate of cannabis related emergency department visits in our study. More research is needed regarding changing methods of cannabis ingestion and trends among specific groups. But yeah, considering no one has ever died from cannabis, um, just the fact that they're studying this is obviously a precaution just to make sure they don't find anything funny, but you know, clearly they didn't because you don't die from cannabis. Anyways, I found that was hilarious. But a good thing about CBD, Charlotte's Web uh, advanced a study on CBD. I know Canopy Growth is the only other one really doing their own studies with CBD um, as the main um, drug, but science through, or they advanced this through a landmark liver safety study, and the study results reaffirmed the safety of Charlotte's Web hemp-derived CBD extracts. Now, I think this just should also be said that it probably posits for all all CBD compounds that, um, well, Charlotte's Web and 11 other companies supported the study to provide sound scientific data on liver toxicity to federal and state regulators, including U.S. Congress and the FDA. Researchers reported of the 839 participants, zero liver toxicity or disease was detected, which means CBD has no negative effects on your liver, which is fantastic. Now, I'm not sure if it, if it depends on how you... Uh, use it if it's inhaled or if it's if it's if it's taken uh, as an edible the study's methodology is a decentralized observation approach with adult consumers of full and broad spectrum hemp extracts and cbd isolates the company provided charlotte's web full spectrum hemp extract uh, products to its required participants each participating cbd company recruited a cohort of participants who are already cbd users and who've been prior cbd users for a minimum of th uh, 30 days to meet the study's criteria. And the study called for a minimum of 681 participants and it netted uh, the amount that it did. But basically, Charlotte's Web was the first, among the first companies to step up and commit to support for this liver safety study. We are grateful for their leadership. So it just goes to show that, yes, it's not governments that lead for the most part. It's companies that, you know, are onto something that want to change the status quo that have to lead the studies themselves find the results and then you know then they can claim that they were leaders in in going through it so just close to show that a lot of this is done by people with private capital themselves and not as much change comes from government intervention or government help as, as we really think so this was just the last interesting thing from the New York Times lighting up later in life. The number of older adults who use cannabis is on the rise and some health experts are concerned. So, um, I mean, I just think this is great that especially in Florida where many Canadians go for winter, uh, they know they can get a green card and they just enjoy being able to smoke cannabis uh, for medicinal reasons, just for any reason. There's there are plenty of reasons to use cannabis. Um, but just wanted to point out that why are health experts concerned? I mean, I, I thought about this. Obviously, if, if you don't know much about cannabis, then, then you're going to be concerned about it. But I'd say, firstly, for decades, health experts have been incentivized to prescribe pills to anyone with a complaint and a pulse. Um, so that's one reason why they've just never looked at cannabis. Um, and they don't know the first thing about it. Who does? Not many people do. Um, only people that are willing to look for the evidence and educate themselves. So let me show you something interesting. This article will be here if you want to read it. Basically just says more older people are turning to cannabis and health experts are getting worried because we don't know what cannabis does. But actually turns out that there were many reports uh, over the past. Um, well, it is often said that little is known about the psychological and physical effects of marijuana in the human user. That's simply error of fact. In addition to many hundreds of significant papers reporting cannabis research throughout the past century, an impressive series of official investigating bodies have reviewed all of the available evidence and have presented their findings at length. The most important of these official cannabis investigations are listed below. This is the 1894 British Raj Commission, uh, the LaGuardia Commission, uh, LaGuardia Airport, named after this governor that was also like, this is insane. There's no evidence that cannabis is, is really bad. We need to consider not criminalizing this or taxing it. Uh, then we have the Ladane Commission from Canada. We also have the Schaefer Commission from 1970, which was um, established by Richard Nixon. He wanted to find out what the toxic effects of cannabis were. Um, and you know, he didn't even wait until 1971 to just criminalize it so that he could start arresting minorities, targeting them to fill the prison system as well, which has become a massive U.S. industry. But in its initial findings, which scheduled for 1972, were not yet available when the Consensus Union report was completed. So basically, Nixon just went ahead and criminalized it. The report ended up finding out that like, hey, yeah, there, there's really not much evidence that cannabis is toxic to the human body. But was Nixon going to allow that to change that, you know, the policy he'd set in place? Absolutely not. 
because he's the leader of the free world. He can do whatever he wants. But I just want to point out that, um, well, th this article, I'm going to go off this. We've chosen accordingly to summarize and review in some detail only one of the major studies, the Ladane Commission. And I want to use the Ladane Commission because I trust Canadians more than I would trust Americans on delivering the accurate information. Now, th that's more of a joke than anything. Um, the Ladane Commission was, was just as valid as any of the other ones, um, and it's just really here. So that's what I'm going to use, but I'm just going to give you some of the facts that they found in the past and why I've just kept saying over and over that so much money has been wasted trying to find the harms of cannabis, yet we know that there are no, there, you haven't found harms. So it's just so unfortunate. And once money can be, you know, spent looking for the positive benefits or seeing what it actually does to the body, um, considering we have an endocannabinoid system in our own body, just there's so much to be learned. And it's just the fact no one knows about this, that they immediately think that we don't know anything. And the Ladane Commission, basically the findings and the conclusions of the Ladane Commission are fair, are a fair sample of findings and conclusions of other, of other studies. So if we go through, um, I want to just start right around here. So against this background, the Ladane Commission reviews the allegations traditionally made against cannabis and reaches conclusions generally similar to those reached by the Indian Hemp's Drug Commission, the Panama Investigating Committees, the LaGuardia Committee, the Wooten Subcommittee, and other responsible bodies which have critically reviewed the evidence. It concludes, for example, that marijuana is not an addicting drug. Users do not develop tolerance in the classical sense, the kind of tolerance that leads to increasing the dosage uh, the intolerance that leads to increasing the dosage. The commission takes note, however, that the statement that of some users that if they stay high for several days in a row, the ex drug experience loses much of its freshness and clarity, and consequently they prefer intermittent use. Whether or not this is a tolerance effect is clearly a benefit. It is clearly a beneficent one. Now, which is great because you know the more you use it, you, well, your tolerance just builds over time. So it's not addicting, and it's not that you need more to to have the same rush. Now, physical dependence on marijuana. Uh, the report adds it has not been demonstrated. It would appear that there are normally no adverse physiological effects or withdrawal symptoms occurring with abstinence from the drug, even in regular users. Reports from the contrary, reports to the contrary from the Easter suspect. Since hashish is smoked with large quantities of tobacco and other drugs in many Eastern countries, these mixtures could be responsible for the minor symptoms reported. Marijuana, it is true, many uh, may in some cases produce psychological dependence, but psychological dependence may be said to exist with respect to many other things in society, like television, music, books, religion, sex, money, favorite foods, certain drugs, hobbies, sports, games. Anyone can develop a psychological dependence to anything. So some degree of psychological dependence is a general normal psychological condition. The short-term physiological effects of marijuana use, the report continues, are usually slight and apparent, apparently have little clinical significance. Even, uh, even overdose produces little acute uh, physiological toxicity. Sleep is the usual somatic consequence of overdose. No deaths due directly to smoking or eating cannabis have ever been documented. The stepping stone theory that marijuana use leads to heroin uh, use is stated, as, but given little credence. In Canada, it appears the heavy use of sedatives, alcohol, and barbiturates rather than cannabis has most frequently preceded heroin use. Yes, we know alcohol is the gateway drug. It's never been cannabis. And again, persons dependent on opiate narcotic narcotics generally have a history of heavy alcohol consumption. The same as noted in part one of this consumer union report is true in the United States. The commission that takes uh, notice of the fear that cannabis smoking like cigarette smoking might lead to lung cancer and other lung uh, pathology. So it takes notice of this, but no evidence currently exists. Uh, it points out to support this view. Moreover, the quantity of leaf consumed by the average cigarette smoker in North America is many times the amount of cannabis smoked by even heavy users, which just means that uh, you know, smokers, heavy smokers will smoke a pack a day. Heavy cannabis user might smoke a couple joints. There's no, the, the amount of <laughs> cigarette smoke consumed compared to cannabis is just a significantly amount more. And then, so yeah, the quantity of leaf, oh, I just mentioned that. Uh, and commission adds, however, the deep inhalation technique usually used with cannabis might add respiratory complications, um, but there does not seem to be any sort of evidence to this. And sorry, I just missed this line. The present pattern by use of regular cannabis smokers in North America is more an an analogous to intermittent alcohol use once or twice a week than to picture the chronic daily use of a of cigarette smoker. And so with respect to psychosis and other adverse psychological effects associated with cannabis, the Ladane Commission report is on the whole quite reassuring. Although there are some well-documented examples of very intense and nightmarish short-term reactions, usually among inexperienced users in unpleasant situations and with high doses, so many 
factors, again, uh, accounting for that, these cases seem to be relatively rare and generally show a rapid recovery. Although many regular users have had an experience with cannabis in which it was the same way unpleasant, freakouts are apparently rare. A Montreal psychiatrist of broad experience with adverse reactions to other drugs, Dr. J.R. Unwin, is quoted as reported in the Can Canadian Medical Association Journal in 1969, I have seen only three adverse reactions in the past two years, all following the smoking of large amounts of hashish and all occurring in individuals with a previous history of psychiatric treatment or for psychiatric or borderline conditions. So people had preconditions and it was just so rare. The US experience, the commission notes, has in general been similar. Thus, Dr. David E. Smith of the Heidi Ashbury Clinic in San Francisco is cited as reporting that he had not observed any cases of cannabis psychosis among the 35,000 marijuana users attending that clinic. So just to wrap this off, True, the commission adds, there are some reports pointing in the other direction, but reports from the eastern countries are of dubious value since no control groups were studied. The question is whether is not whether or not marijuana smokers, like some non-smokers, develop psychosis, but whether the use of cannabis increases the incidence of psychosis. And Dr. J.T. Underleger, uh, later appointed by as a member of Nixon's National Commission of Cannabis and Drug, Drug Abuse, reported observing 1,887 adverse reactions to cannabis in Los Angeles, but these data were difficult to interpret since no clear definition of adverse reaction is provided and no follow-ups were made. So clearly, follow-ups might not have been needed if, if if none were made. But a few psychosis reported during uh, reported among U.S. forces in Vietnam may or not be traceable to cannabis use. They involved individuals who had consumed large doses of potent material under conditions of increased <laughs> physical and psychological stress. Yeah, well, most were also doing heroin then because they realized once they got to Vietnam that it was not worth being there and that they got themselves into a mess because they didn't know what they were getting themselves into. Now, it is hardly necessary to invoke cannabis as an explanation for the few psychosis among soldiers uh, belated in a distant land and fighting on foreign fields. To the extent that psychosis d do occur in on rare occurrences, or sorry, on rare occasions following cannabis use, they appear to be a reflection of very special personality difficulties in the subject involved or the exceptional dose level. So again, it's never usually cannabis. It is the subject or the person experiencing it just like anything else. So um, I just wanted to show you all that because that was relevant. And you know, just by finding this, it was like, okay, cool. I can find all of these reports in one spot. So for anyone willing to look, can go find it. But um, let me know what you think, folks. Was that interesting for you to, to read through? Please, I suggest that you grab this link and read through it yourself because it's, it's quite fascinating. And, you know, that's why I'm so adamant on the fact that we know that there are no negative benefits because I've read most of the literature, uh, especially for making the series Reality Check Cannabis in 2020 that I made. So, hey, if you can find holes in my thesis, please comment below. Let me know because I want to find out how I could possibly be wrong. But up until now, I have not been and everything just kind of keeps adding to the momentum that we have behind us, leading us forward, folks. So trust that I think this week and this month has been the calm before the storm, and we will see the cannabis industry turn around, um, you know, going forward. And again, long term, this industry is just getting started. So thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe uh, if you don't want to miss any future videos. And I'll catch you tomorrow for a special video of Cresco Labs earnings. Very excited, and I hope they're going to be good. Hope you all have a great week, everybody.